hi um so i'm making this video to kind of go over my portfolio to to hopefully help you with your submission process and just kind of get more videos out there because i know there's like one by alex graff and then a couple other people but you know there isn't that much out there for emily carr specifically so i wanted to kind of do one that was tailored specifically to emily carr um so a little bit about me is i actually applied for fall intake of 2022, um, cause I graduated in June of 2022. Um, but I didn't get in because reflecting back on it, my portfolio was really bad, <laughs> like really bad. So we'll go over my initial portfolio that was rejected. And then we'll go over my new portfolio, um, that was accepted for January of 2023. Um, something, if you are applying for transfer, like I did, something that you should keep in mind is to make sure that you have the proper transfer credits, like enough credits at your current university to be able to just jump right into, um, class at Emily Carr, because I was emailing with the admissions office and that was something that they said was really important and would really kind of help you, um, in your application because they would prioritize people who are already basically up to date and can just like kind of start. My phone is currently resting on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13 books. It's also resting on my box set of Lord of the Rings, so that's fun. Anyways. So, um, for my first application, we can go through the process projects first and then go through the entire portfolio as it is. In Slide Room, there isn't the option for the process ones to submit words to go along with it to kind of explain your work. Um, so I didn't do that for the process project and actually I didn't do that for the entire portfolio, which is not something you should do. Word of advice, write down, like, just even if it's like small, just like something about your piece, like an exhibition text, essentially. Um, I think you have a maximum of like 2000 characters or something like that. Um, so you're able to kind of get a lot in there which I didn't do, which I believe is the main reason why my portfolio was rejected. The prompt was, in one original image or 20 second media clip, answer the question, how is creativity important for both the individual and the community? Um, I was kind of inspired by like Instagram and how the algorithm and the mechanical aspect kind of makes it hard for people to properly be creative and get recognized for that creativity. Okay, so the next one, we're just gonna try to go through this really fast because it was rejected. Um, in three original images, tell us a story about yourself. Um, and it was just a little story of me at camp, like catching grasshoppers. And then for the final one, uh, it was using three different materials, build a model of what you would put in the center of a public space, include process sketches and photographs. So I did this little like resin piece. I was essentially imagining it hanging like in the middle of a high class mall or something like that. It's talking about kind of like sustainability and like the urbanization and destruction of our planet essentially um you know because malls are very urban so i'm just gonna quickly read what i wrote for the for how i feel about the entire creative process by writing no more than 50 words so what i wrote was throughout this process i found my standards had increased immensely all these ideas went through many different iterations some being fully completed before i scrapped them it was challenging to learn a new medium resin as well as try to convey my story and themes only through visuals so I evidently knew that I could put words, but I didn't. Okay, so my first piece for the rejected one was called Marigolds and Coreopsis, and it was a piece of fan art. Don't put fan art, <laughs> just like full stop. They they even put it in their updated like portfolio requirements for this time around, because I think they just get so many so much fan art and it doesn't say anything about you as an artist. And fan art is great. I love fan art, it's amazing. It's also really good for getting your name out there and social media and helping people find you. But just like in this, they want to see a lot about you and not your interests, but rather about who you are as a person. And fan art doesn't really say much about that. Next was a photograph I took of my friend called Imperfect Perfection. And it was kind of about beauty standards for women. And this friend had really bad acne. So I kind of um, used that and the grayscale to kind of emphasize the acne. But again, no words. So all they got was imperfect perfection with the picture. So, uh, and then Beijing, which was a traditional acrylic piece that I did, uh, talking about the air quality of Beijing and how a lot of it doesn't stem 
from like the people as a whole, but just from one individual at the top making all these decisions. Again, no words. Portrait of a lady. This was essentially me trying to show them, hey, I can do realism, but it wasn't that realistic. Um, and also, again, didn't really say much about me. Uh, temple, another piece of fan art. Sky Children with Light fan art. I was really proud of it, but I had copied a screenshot and it was, again, not anything about me. So, and then Journey, this was a cyanotype piece I did, um, talking about kind of femininity and the journey towards self-love and things like that. Uh, Ballad of the Banshees cover, more fan art. I really did not know what I was doing. Um, uh, it's, it was a cover for a zine I did for Scar and Basha from the Owl House. And then Protect, this was basically just an acrylic piece that I did. Um, it had no meaning and I tried to assign it meaning, which was not very thoughtful. And then Mountain Concept, this was a very generic idea for a very generic mountain. Really, I'm not happy with this portfolio. And then Where Water Met Electricity cover, this is another piece of fan art, a cover for a Khorasami zine. So in conclusion, don't do fan art. <laughs> don't do fan art and write descriptions because it will help you so much if the evaluator knows that you know what you're talking about and also knows the meaning behind the pieces. Because you could have the deepest piece ever, but they would have no idea. I feel like <laughs> this really should have been obvious to me, but it wasn't somehow. Okay, so for process documentation, um, I actually got some help from my friend Purple Almonds, Tiffany Hayashi for this, and it turned out absolutely amazing because of her help. So really thank you. It's, oh, it was great. Okay, um, so this was a piece that I did for just like a personal project. Um, I was trying to do a concept for like this town that had a kind of like mythos surrounding it of a hydra where like long ago in their lands, like a hydra was slain. And now the dragons that live in their rivers um, are the, the cutoff heads of the hydra. So, but they don't really know what a hydra looks like. Um, so I kind of got to play with how they would interpret a hydra based on the ideas of what's available to them. I did basically just like the entire process of creating a piece of concept art. I explored uh, different cultural inspirations, um, I did just a general idea sketch um, and then I created like a visual language, uh, came up with different architectural concepts uh, and then I did a final piece. I taught myself Blender for this which was a big undertaking. Um, I had some help from this one guy I met on the Blender server who was like, yeah sure I can walk you through the entire way of how to do this. So he taught me how to make the tower and then from there I just made everything else myself. Basically what you want from your process is to make it as clear and straightforward and simple as possible. You can have writing but make it as to the point as you can because the evaluator doesn't really want to sit there reading the entire time. They want to look and see the progression of your ideas visually. So just remember that. Um, I looked at a lot of people in the industry and how they kind of format their portfolios and their process. I also looked at like the art of books. So for like Disney and stuff, like I really liked um, the art of Luca book and the art of Encanto, things like that. Um, and seeing how they kind of format their, um, their layouts for their processes. So then for the studio assignment, um, you had the option to choose one out of four prompts. I chose the first prompt, which was create something that reflects on the environment where you live whether it be your home, your neighborhood, your geographic location. This can be in any medium. So as I was working on this piece, um, I had already started college. I'm going to Western currently in Ontario. Um, highly recommend the fine arts program if you aren't really into like commercial art, if you wanna do like kind of like fine art, fine art, you know? Um, the, the facilities here are pretty good. It's just like one building, but it's a nice building. Um, Anyways, so I did it about uh, Western. So I mixed Middlesex College with uh, Ontario Hall, which is the residence where I'm staying. And I found it kind of interesting because Western's whole kind of aesthetic is very like castly and medieval. They, they use a lot of like these bricks everywhere. All of the buildings look really cool. Um, and then you get to like the more modern buildings. So I mixed Middlesex College, which is very much like castly with Ontario Hall, which is very modern. 
because it's a, it's a pretty new building. I think it was built in like 2013 or something like that. Um, and so I did kind of just like a basic piece of background art with that because I really like background art. And then for writing, um, I was able to choose one question out of five, of, out of five questions. Um, and I chose the first one again. Um, and it asked, why do you make? Tell us about what drives you and motivates you to work creatively and, in, and to engage with material processes. So I'm gonna read what I wrote. Um, on my laptop, I have a folder labeled favorite art. It hasn't always existed, but several years ago, I began to spend time looking at my finished pieces. It became necessary to group all of my pieces in one place for me to browse, like a mini gallery just for me. Whenever I'm in a slump or lacking motivation, I go back to that folder and trace my growth over time. The feeling of accomplishment that comes from looking at my work and all of the variety of mediums and ideas I've explored is often what keeps me going. Not only that, but the ability to see how my own interests have changed over time or reflect on the thoughts that were going through my head as I worked on a piece is one of the things I most enjoy about creating. My work is a snapshot of the artists that inspire me at the time and the media environment and people around me. My style and interests shift as I find new experiences and artists to draw from in my own work. So pretty self-explanatory. Um, so then for the portfolio, uh, we could just dive right in. Basically, as we go through, I'm going to just read what I wrote. And then if I have more comments to add, I will. But most of these I don't because I wrote essentially what I needed to say. And I was able to fit it all in within the character limit. So my first piece is called Imposter Syndrome. As of late, I've been leading and organizing a fanzine, one that is physical and for profit. It's called Fragile Things. Um, it's a Centaur World fanzine. Depending on when I release this, there might be leftover sales. So you should check it out if you like Centaur World. Throughout this experience, I constantly do not feel like enough. When people put their money, effort, and time into a project, you want it to live up to expectations. But in doing so, put immense amounts of pressure upon yourself to be perfect and never make mistakes. I implemented the sleeping woman haloed in the curve of an eye as an image of a frequent thought of escapism for me. Forever sleep, because when you are asleep, there are no opportunities to make mistakes. With the limited color palette, I used it to impart upon the viewer the sense of melancholy and constant worry that plagues me. The various patterns draw the eye throughout the composition and create a sense of false depth in the 2D patterns. Digital, August 2022. So as for like the last bits, you don't really need to put the medium and date, but I wanted to because I felt like it would kind of help get a sense of the different mediums that I use as well as the variation that I was able to put in my portfolio. Um, and as for the dates, I just wanted to kind of have like a little bit of a chronological kind of idea. Not that it's ordered chronologically, um, just that they're able to see like potential improvement. If they see a piece that they really like, then they're able to see, oh, that was made very recently. And also I made this all in the span of April, May, June, July, August, September. Six months. I made this all in the span of six months because I got rejected April 1st. Um, and then I immediately started working on my new portfolio. So I was kind of able to do it really quickly and I'm pretty proud with how it came out. Another thing, what I really focused on in my writing was to kind of touch on the concept of the piece, but also the technical elements that aided the concept and what I wanted to have the viewer experience with each piece. So style experimentation study one, um, cause I did two of these. Um, I experimented with two different styles. Something that I really like about backgrounds is I really like like really messy line art for backgrounds. There's this one artist, Alarico. I love his work. It's absolutely amazing. But then there's also so many artists that do like this lineless style that I really love. So I'm kind of caught between two extremes. Uh, so I kind of tried both of them out. So for this one, I wrote, for this study, I wanted to combine my lines detailing with painted textures to create an overall harmonious and stylized image. My goal was to have an organic look to this piece with no lines being completely straight. Below the line art, I used a subtle painting style to imply texture while not being fully rendered. This balancing act between realism and stylism is something that I often find challenging and this exercise aided me in progressing my skills on that front. On a conceptual level, I chose a reference that evoked nostalgia in me for a place that I have not experienced, yet it still gives me a sense of home. The cozy setting and the organic style work in tandem to achieve the nostalgic feeling. I gave it a small cozy atmosphere with the focused light and weathered wood, which brings to mind times in my first home, while copious plants and doors remind me of my time in Morocco, of exploring the inner reaches of Medina's. Digital, July 2022. So I did mention Morocco. Um, I lived there for two years, uh, for my last two years of high school. So there will be like different mentions 
to the various places I've lived. I don't know if I mentioned more than Morocco because Morocco is just like the most recent and so the most vivid in my mind. Overworked and underpaid. I'm pretty proud of this one. I like it a lot. Uh, this piece explores modern day capitalism and the drain it puts on creativity. I wanted to convey this person's life through their bedroom, someone who I imagined to work in an environment like Amazon with organic line work and a musty interior. There are dirty dishes on the desk and the bed is unmade. The inhabitant of the room has no time to tidy up. There are some half finished paintings in the corner and a photo of a cat that is suspiciously missing from the room. The whole room is dank and ratty since the job that they spend so much time at pays them barely enough to get by. I used rough painting below the lines to enhance the grime of the room and added subtle textures in places like the window for added detail. I used a cool palette with an emphasis on a sickly green. The yellow green shade that I used conjures up the feelings of nausea, uncomfortableness, and overall unpleasantness. Digital, June 2022. Next one, schnitz. Um, my cat who just died like a month ago. Anyways, I have a tattoo that I got of her. Um, about a month ago, it's about a month healed. Um, she had died several days before, um, and I made this piece before she died. This is a piece exploring my cat Schnitzel and her growth through the years. We got her when she was very young, and for as long as I can remember, she was scared of everything. Now, as a 14-year-old cat, she's able to stand her ground and displays much more confidence. Younger Schnitzel is deathly afraid of everything, including her older self, while the older version is able to appreciate her own growth and confidence. I was inspired by Pixar concept art and tried to analyze their use of expressive faces and imperfect coloring. This can be seen in the yellow of the doorway, where it doesn't quite fill in on all the gaps. I also contrasted the whites of their eyes with the shadowed fur to draw the gaze straight towards their faces and the expressions they make as their eyes meet. Digital May 2022. I need some water. Oof. It's my favorite water bottle. I got it specifically because it has this thing so I can chew on it. Queen of the Cat Kingdom. A character design of the regal queen of a cat kingdom. I took inspiration from today's rich 1% who dress in nondescript clothes to appeal to the average person. Their wealth is in the quality. Steve Jobs may wear a black turtleneck, but it is expensive fabric. I took this idea and applied it to my design, using this tactic to emphasize how confident she is in the power she holds. This is shown in the way she presents herself. Her outfit is simple, but in rich colors, and the jewel embedded in her forehead and small accessories show off her wealth in a more subtle way, since she feels no need to flaunt it. I originally started my idea with a long-haired tomcat, who is the opposite, having had to work to get to his place of power and thus demonstrated it in more over-the-top ways. But he leaned too much into the traditionally accepted idea of a king, so I wanted to flip the script. Digital June 2022. George. I love George. He is such a sweetie. Um, he's based off of some sketches that I just did while I was sitting on the couch just with my family and watching TV. And I was like, I want to do some shape characters. Um, so anyways, here's what I wrote. I set out looking to make a cute, simple design using big shapes. George is a bat consisting of just a head, ears, and legs. When he gets his cloak, however, it makes him seem much more complete, despite the fact that if you were to look under it, all you would see is an endless black void. I wanted a character where I could really push the poses and expressions while still keeping on model. I'd imagine George as a character for a TV show where it shows all the hijinks he gets up to. Digital April 2022. So this was one of the first pieces I did, like, after my rejection. And then we have Elevated George. Um, it's a George sculpture. I made a clay sculpture of George in addition to the initial design to explore a new medium with familiar subject matter. I found it very challenging to work with 3D as I'm unfamiliar with it, so there were many learning hurdles involved, like the tools for fine details and making a cohesive, symmetrical shape. Air Dry Clay, April 2022. Universal. This one took a while because I'm not good at patterns um, and this has a lot of patterns in it and I request that you don't look too closely because there are many imperfections. Using an old pair of skates, I painted this design I created onto them. I've moved around the world my entire life and everywhere I've gone, there has always been at least one ice rink. No matter where you go, figure skating is the same. In Morocco, there may be a different word for a toe loop, but it is still a toe loop nonetheless. I used common motifs from traditional Moroccan mosaics and the iconic colors of Chef Shawan to show that some things like figure skating are universal. This was the first draft of my text and I was just really happy with it. So I kept it as it was because most of them I went through several times and I added more, took away some. This one, I just left it because I, I was really happy with it. Uh, acrylic on leather, June 2022. I actually donated the skates to my rink in Morocco uh, before I left. Uh, so if you are ever at Mega Mall in Rabat, um, take a look above the food counter and you might see my skates. So here's the second style experimentation study. Uh, this is a study of a photo where I tried to use more lineless style. 
utilizing contrast between various hues and values to gain definition in the form and implementing screen tones for more of a style distinction. I love the solid, polished look of many concept artists' work, so I tried to adapt it to my own skills. My reference image was a modern apartment whose prominent shapes worked well for what I wanted to play with in my style. Digital, August 2022. Big me vibes. This is a collage I did. I'm really happy with it. Um, and it's really cute. When I was young, I loved pink, even begged my mom to repaint my then purple room. As I grew and became more aware of cultural norms, I convinced myself that in order to be recognized as a woman, I had to let go of traditionally feminine things. I eventually came to realize the toxicity in this way of thinking, and this mixed media collage works to re-embrace parts of myself that I may have previously disliked. I painted a watercolor self-portrait and surrounded myself with various images to symbolize different aspects of myself. The chameleon to represent how, even though with each place I move, the way I present myself shifts slightly. I eventually reclaim my true self. The Shakespeare excerpts in the back capture my love for reading, and the bright pink tissue paper flowers draw on the aforementioned pink dilemma, a childlike playfulness that I now enjoy about myself. Mace Media Collage, April 2022. You can see I have my lovely pink pillow over here. Um, it's my favorite pillow. It's very comfortable and it's good for hosting friends, which I don't do very often, but it's good when it is there. Figure skating costume designs. So I did a bunch of costume designs just for my friends, so I included them. For these designs, I wanted to create costumes with a cohesive look and try different variations of skin tone, theme, and cut. Each costume is meant to be paired with a specific mood, just like for a real figure skating program, where the costume would match conceptually with the athlete's music. I planned on using the top right costume for my own program, the song Nothing Good, sung by Leah Salonga, but I ended up not being able to compete. Digital, March 2022. The Hippo. Um, please enjoy this little showing of my amazing animation. Hippopotamus, Hippopotamus. Hippopotamus. Ah. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Here's what I wrote. The hippo goes walking. I tried my hand at animation using audio sung by Oscar Isaac to show a short scene of a cute hippo who doesn't quite look where he's going. I enjoyed f figuring out the walk cycle, but when it came time to clean the frames, I ran out of energy for the project, so it still looks very sketchy. Despite this, I'm super happy with how it turned out, especially for my first serious foray into animation. Digital, July 2022. Um, I'm happy with it. I kept like trying to add more, like clean up all the lines, but I just could not bring myself to do it because I was just so tired. <laughs> and here's Wasp. Um, this one was fairly early on in my college career. Um, I did it in class for my drawing class. Um, so here's what I wrote. A piece done for my drawing class, it is an observational depiction of a wasp who was a very polite model, especially for a wasp. I love the sharp value contrast in wasps, so I made sure to emphasize that in my work. Pencil and paper, September 2022. Pretty straightforward. It's just an observational piece. There's a glitch in the matrix! I like this one. My mom got it framed for my brother. I don't know if he actually has it up in his room or house, but it is framed. Um, <laughs> uh, this piece showcases the disconnect we can have between our own image of ourselves and the one we show the world around us. Sometimes it can be very distressing to see yourself as others see you. Watercolor on paper, June 2022. Some of the ones that have like more like nebulous meanings, I kind of kept really short because it's kind of like, yeah, I can explain this in two sentences that are very vague, but also artsy, you know? Um, I don't know if those helped or detracted from my portfolio. Take from it what you will. Oh geez, not again. Many people look at this piece and they're like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I had my friend look at it recently and they were like, I know this one's a hand, but what is this? And I was like, this is so, so hand. Anyways, this is a painting showing how I feel when I get a panic attack. They have plagued me for years now and it, fe and it feels like every nerve is lit up. My heart is racing and I need to get all the energy out. In this case, by shaking my hands. I utilize the medium to relate to the theme as well. The entire painting was done with tea blueberry and English breakfast. Most teas have caffeine in them, which makes my anxiety spike, so I decided to use tea as a medium to help convey the limitations my anxiety places upon me. The purple outline to the outlines to the hands imply movement, while the negative space in the background shows lightning for both movement and the rapid firing of neurons. Tea on watercolor paper, May 2022. One thing, so I did the portfolio review, and something that they mentioned is what they're looking for is vulnerability and kind of like not only just personal aspects to your pieces, but also things that make them uncomfortable. Um, I 
found it very hard to toe the line between uncomfortable good and uncomfortable bad. So I was really, really trying to like stay right on that line. Um, and so for this piece, I kind of wanted to explain more in detail that gave a lot more vulnerability to the evaluator about myself. Um, and you'll see it come up a bit later as well, the vulnerability. Uh, this piece is titled Don't Touch. This is an observational painting combining items from my past and present. The three foreground items were all pieces of decoration in my parents and grandmother's house. It was an unspoken rule that they were just for decoration and not for playing with. This is contrasted with the kalimba in my present, which was made to be touched. As I've matured, I've gained access to each of these objects in a variety of ways. I gained the confidence to ask my grandmother if I could have the frog. I have the frame of mind to properly handle decorative items. As time passed, my brother left for college, so his attachments to the cat lamp faded, and I was able to claim it for myself. Acrylic on Canvas, June 2022. For that piece, I actually um, literally had the setup at my table. I had a lamp shining on it, so it was very like art school -y. Like it wasn't just I took a picture of it. No, I like stared at it for hours while I worked. Um, so I was able to kind of replicate a little bit of like the traditional way of doing observational pieces. Next we have Mindscape. This piece explores what the inside of my mind would look like if it were a place. My mind is a beautiful tree surrounded by fireflies, filled to the brim with books and binders of information. Though some parts are organized, others are an absolute mess. The same applies to the mini-me's running through the area. Some are frantic, others know exactly what they're doing, and others still are off task and just doing whatever strikes their fancy. Digital April 2022. Please enjoy this. these little close-ups of the piece. Uh, you can see all the different little mini-me's and what we're doing. So this piece topic. This was the last one. I had like room for one more piece in my portfolio. I was like, boom, I'll just slap this one in there. It was kind of like a little experiment with like inky kind of styling. Something that I've noticed as being pervasive in society is the fetishization of women living woman relationships. Men insert themselves into every aspect of society, even when there's no place for them there. Some people define lesbianism as not being attracted to men, putting the focus of sexuality on the man rather than the loving of women. One of the most popular categories in adult videos this was me trying to be like very, this is a school. <laughs> um, and, and adult videos is lesbian, and these films are not made for the female gaze, rather for voyeuristic men who subconsciously wish to be included in a relationship with no place for them. I show this in my composition, placing the viewer in, a, in the position of a man, pushed out of the composition by the columns blocking their view, and the women completely focused on each other. The women are highlighted in bright light, not for the viewer's sake, their view is partially blocked, but for their own. It took inspiration from the 1920s and Art Deco for the hair and background. Digital, September 2022. What's wrong with being confident? Um, yes, that is the title to a Demi Lovato song, and yes, I do still love it a lot. Um, both this piece and a Demi Lovato song. <laughs> uh, this was another kind of point of vulnerability for me. The journey to self-confidence can be a long and arduous one. For me, it took many years to finally become happy with my body image. I've struggled with disordered eating centered around my anxiety, periods of questioning my identity, and a lack of consistent friends as I moved around so often. I had to rely on myself to be confident, and self-love was a muscle that took many years to strengthen. I wanted to show the point that I'm at now in my journey of self-love in this piece, relying less on accuracy of form and more on the textures that are possible with digital art, my preferred medium, and one that has brought me great confidence in my skills to convey the image. The bright yellow against my shadowed silhouette in the foreground draws attention to it and the subtle expression of contentment on my face. Digital June 2022. And this is my final piece. Um, I got some advice from my printmaking teacher uh, that this piece was like the strongest one to leave off on. So it's called Come As You Are For You Are Enough. This is a piece I did as a development of a vertical cipher. I wanted to sim simulate vintage in ink work and have the letters be readable, but also work together to create an aesthetically pleasing look. The cipher acts as an alphabet that uses different marks to convey letters as the viewer's eye moves down the piece. Conceptually, I wanted to explore religious imagery and how many religions seek to place the worshiper in a place of inferiority. I made the woman offering up a gift look deity like herself, accompanied by the cipher text, come as you are, for you are enough. Digital June, 2022. And that is my entire portfolio. Um, I heard back from the school several days ago. It was several days ago. I heard back from them several days ago that I got in and I did cry a bit because I put in a lot of effort and a lot of work. Um, 
and I am so glad and so grateful that I'm gonna be able to go this uh, spring. I hope this video helped a little bit with your portfolio making and I'm gonna have like a little list going on right now that you can probably be seeing. Just like the main points that I made throughout the video of just kind of like tips for the portfolio and different things that you can keep in mind just in case you don't want to sit through and watch the whole thing um, and you just want to like go and look at each piece and then just get to the end and just kind of read the tips instead of listening to me intersperse them in my commentary. Um, I wish you the best of luck with your portfolio because um, I know that it's really challenging and takes a lot out of you especially opening yourself up both like in the vulnerability sense, but also opening yourself up to rejection. I wish you the best of luck on your application. And even if you aren't applying to Emily Carr, these are just like general portfolio tips. And just like, you're able to kind of see what I did and hopefully get a better sense of what you can do as well. And if you currently go to Emily Carr and you see this video, hit me up. Um, my socials are in the description and we could totally be friends. Um, I'm going to need friends because I'm coming in late. <laughs> so everyone already has friends but I just wanted to kind of document this and get it out there so that more people who are applying to Emily Carr can have more things to look at and more ideas to just generate for their portfolios I wish you all the best of luck in applying to Emily Carr or if you're applying to a different school I hope you get into that one as well um and bye